Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't expect such a crowd, but I'm, I'm happy you're here. Uh, so, this is everything you ever wanted to know about OpenStack at scale. Seriously, everything. No, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're going to go through um, our views on OpenStack scalability and kind of uh, some basic scaling models and paradigms. And uh, let's see here, maybe I was supposed to explain this on the Y slide. You just uh, scroll back like this. Okay, yeah. right. So we're going to talk about basic scaling models. We're going to talk about um, how they apply to OpenStack, uh, where they fail, where they succeed. Um, but kind of, I just want to introduce you to the motivation of this talk. So I work with Marantis full time. Uh, work with OpenStack for the last four years, Marantis for the last two, and I think I have heard this question more than any other question about OpenStack. Is how does it scale? How do you go bigger? Right? I think the other question is, how do you upgrade it? <laughs> All right, so we, we want to do a general overview, component by component, and then we will have some time for questions at the end. Um, let's see here. Here we go. So there's kind of our overview, three core sections, scaling models, core OpenStack services, and then we, we have some special buggers here at the end um, that we'll make special mention of. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Randy. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Randy DeFowle. I've worked in Marantis for about a year now, and my background is uh, a little less on the system architecture side, uh, so Mike's specialized in that. He's run very large uh, OpenStack clouds. I come a little bit more of a uh, uh, application and cloud solution side, uh, but I do have worked with a lot of different types of distributed systems over my career, including some of the big data systems and distributed consensus algorithms. So I found uh, some of the scaling problems in OpenStack to be pretty interesting from that perspective. So uh, before we jump into the component by component, I just wanted to uh, cover some general scaling models and paradigms, which I think help frame the problem. I mean, one thing that's really interesting to me about OpenStack versus systems I worked with in the past, like Hadoop, is that OpenStack is, you know, a very complicated system, and there are so many different components that scale in different ways. And so one of the big challenges, I think, for those of you who maybe have worked with other systems in the past and are now looking at scaling OpenStack, is that you have to be really specific about which particular bottleneck you're trying to address, because with OpenStack, what I found personally is that if you dive into a problem, you can quickly become confused about looking at a lot of different possibilities. And so it's, you have to be really careful about identifying the actual specific component that's the bottleneck before you figure out the best way to solve it. And I can say that from uh, somewhat painful experience even over the last couple of weeks, as, as Mike knows. So anyway, uh, of course, one uh, scale-up model that's, you know, traditional one is scaling up, just throwing more resources at the problem. Uh, and this, you know, still is, is relevant in OpenStack. Michael talked a little bit about how this works even for, you know, the, the MySQL or Postgres database that's used by OpenStack. And uh, this, of course, works until you hit some limit that uh, is, is just too hard to overcome. And what's interesting is that you can think about this limit for a specific thing like uh, OpenStack, you know, MySQL database, you can only throw so much RAM at the problem or you can only, you know, increase uh, drive speed to a certain extent. But if you look at it as a system as a whole, so if you start thinking about a particular component of OpenStack, uh, say like, uh, you know, a Galera cluster, um, there's, even though it is in one sense a distributed system, um, there's still this fundamental bottleneck you hit uh, if you look at it as a system as a whole. And so the, uh, you know, the example I always fall back on is distributed consensus algorithms like Paxos. You reach a certain size, the quorum gets too big, and adding more nodes doesn't help you any because the overhead of the voting gets so heavy. And we actually see that in OpenStack. For instance, uh, one customer I've worked with tried to have a, uh, a Keystone database that was distributed over many sites. Each one had a four node Galera cluster. And talking about going to six sites, a 24 node Galera cluster, it, you know, if you think of that as a single unit, uh, it just starts to get too big. Uh, so trying to scale Galera beyond 15 nodes is, can be really difficult. So the, of course, the next general scaling model is the scale-out model. I always love the, the Grace Hopper quote because I just have this picture in my head of a gigantic ox for some reason. Uh, but, <clears throat> of course, we can try to, a lot of things in OpenStack, you can just try to add 
more pieces, uh, more nodes to the problem. So if a lot of the OpenStack control services you can scale out by, say, instead of running three Keystone controllers, you can run five if Keystone is a bottleneck for you. Uh, but of course, again, looking at it as a system, the key thing you have to be aware of is there's always a, a tax you have to pay. There's some level of coordination that you have to invest in to make those five Keystone instances work together as a coherent unit. And in OpenStack, that's really important because that, those overheads tend to become some key bottlenecks. So things like RabbitMQ, which is the glue that kind of holds a lot of these pieces together. Um, and, and Mike will talk more about that later. Uh, so again, just in general, when you're looking at scaling problems in OpenStack, it's really important to think about the difference between looking at components and looking at systems. Because by scaling out a particular component of OpenStack, you're actually scaling up the system as a whole, and you'll end up running into some of these bottlenecks like I just talked about. You know, for instance, uh, those of you who've worked in big data before, you know that Hadoop, of course, as a distributed file system, can scale out to be, you know, fairly large. But even in Hadoop, you end up with things like the name node, or in some cases, even the resource manager in Yarn, becoming a new bottleneck you have to worry about. And so, you know, in the Hadoop community, they, the name node, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is the part of the Hadoop distributed file system that knows where different chunks of files are on different actual servers in the distributed file system. And uh, this started out just being one of those, and so it was definitely a scaling bottleneck. Uh, so if you just kept adding more data nodes into your Hadoop cluster, it could be a real, a real scaling issue. And so the Hadoop community has started to look at things like sharding that, dividing the distributed file system into different namespaces. And you'll see that same pattern happen with some parts of OpenStack. So for instance, even if you look at the, uh, the data plane in OpenStack, you can keep adding more and more compute nodes, but at some point it starts to stress out things like the Nova scheduler. And so the OpenStack community is starting to look at things like federation and sharding. Uh, if you've ever heard of Nova Cells, which is a somewhat still an experimental feature, but is going to become a lot more prominent in Mataka and Newton, uh, there's actually a really good talk on that a couple of days ago. You can look up the video on it. Uh, you'll see some of these same patterns being repeated now uh, in OpenStack. So <clears throat> just wanted to focus on uh, one particular example that I think is kind of interesting because it, it kind of ties into some of the, uh, the buzz you'll hear about containers and how they may fit into the OpenStack picture. So if you look at schedulers, and I'm personally invested in this because I've been helping uh, someone kind of troubleshoot a potential scheduler bottleneck the past few weeks. The Nova scheduler to me, uh, even though, you know, if you look at it just in isolation, it does have a scale out model. You can add more Nova scheduler services running on more controller nodes. Uh, but, you know, from a system point of view, it's very much a centralized system. The Nova scheduler has to have global knowledge over the capabilities of the entire data plane, unless you, you know, are one of the early adopters of things like Nova cells. And not only that, but it has to, through the use of filters, it has to have a lot of knowledge about what tenants may be asking of it. So tenants can pass in hints like I would need a, a flavor that's tied into specific host aggregate properties. Maybe I need a node that has SRIOV uh, capabilities. But that scheduler, because it has to have this global view of, of pretty much everything about the system and everything tenants may be asking of it, the Nova scheduler ends up being uh, a common scaling bottleneck. And you know, what we've seen in practice uh, in our scale lab is that you can end up running the scheduler up to about 12,000 VMs on a couple hundred of compute nodes. And depending on your configuration, your mileage may vary. But there's a, there's a ballpark figure where we think the scheduler uh, monolithically is, is going to become a real bottleneck. And it's interesting to compare that to some of the newer uh, container-based schedulers. Uh, Apache Mesos is one I like to look at. Has a much different uh, federated scheduling model. So there's a separation of concerns there where the scheduler, Mesos scheduler itself, really doesn't want to know everything about the entire state of the cluster and everything tenants may be asking of it. It really just passes on resource offers from different parts of the cluster and then application frameworks can choose to accept or reject those resource offers. So in some ways, it's a lot more lightweight of a scheduling model. Uh, and I'm kind of oversimplifying, but it is a, a useful comparison. What's really interesting about Mesos is there's production systems that are known to run at 50,000 nodes, which to me is you know, several times larger than what we would feel comfortable with for a single monolithic OpenStack data plane. And this is really interesting because some of the new container uh, concepts floating around OpenStack, like Magnum, 
actually introduce this kind of separation of scheduling concerns. Uh, Magnum, you know, it's, it's a fairly new project. I don't have a lot of uh, extensive field experience with it, but projects like Magnum or the Kubernetes packages on Murano, they'll actually use the Nova scheduler to carve off a chunk of your OpenStack cloud, you know, indir you know directly or indirectly orchestrated via heat or something like that. Uh, but they'll take a chunk of Nova and other resources and just make it available to one of these other schedulers. And then you can go and invoke, uh, you know, cube control if you're using Kubernetes or you can invoke Marathon if you're using Mesos and use a container orchestration engine. So you kind of get the separation of scheduling concerns. That's an interesting model. I think it's kind of an open question operationally how well that works. There's some other uh, questions it raises. Uh, but anyway, these are some of the, some of the newer directions that uh, you may see in OpenStack over the next uh, few releases. So enough of the theoretical, let's get down to, uh, I guess, some of the nitty gritty about different OpenStack services. So a lot of this information is, you know, summarizing some field knowledge that, you know, folks like Mike and some of the other solution and system architects at Mirantis have put together over the years. Uh, we'll start with Keystone. Uh, Keystone, of course, is a central service for OpenStack. A lot of, you know, pretty much every other service has to interact with Keystone to some extent. Keystone to me is a pretty interesting uh, system because the Keystone API services are really easy to scale. They're active active behind a load balancer. You can scale out, just add more Keystone controller nodes into the control plane. Uh, but what's more interesting about Keystone is the authentication and authorization backends. And here, depending on your backend, you have a lot of different ways you can possibly uh, scale up or scale out. So for instance, if you're using internal Keystone, uh, you know, just have it in the same MySQL database the rest of the control plane uses, then it you know, can scale out the same as your MySQL database. If you're using LDAP, I really think of it as a scale up model because uh, LDAP's typically owned by some other department and I make it their problem. Uh, but LDAP is a system that can become, you know, has proven itself can run at pretty large scale. Uh, and then for some of the newer deployments, uh, particularly if you're running multi-region, you can actually have federated keystone. So you can have local keystones that actually defer back to a centralized keystone for authentication. So a lot of different ways you can try to, cho to uh, scale keystone depending uh, really on your deployment model. And with that, I'll leave it to, I'll turn it over to Mike and he's gonna walk through some of the other services. Thanks, Randy. Um, so Nova is an interesting case. I think pretty much every OpenStack deployment out there um, probably uses Nova as one of the core services. Uh, Nova, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the scheduler. Um, Nova has uh, Nova has been deployed at scale at different locations, right? We have some examples: uh, Acorn, uh, Bluehost, CERN, Rackspace. Um, and primarily because it has this uh, idea of application level sharding, we'll call it cells, right? So cells, cells v1 is not for everyone and uh, not recommended unless you have a team of experts to, to help you out. But, uh, but cells v2, which is going to be implemented in Newton, it will become the way that Nova works. Uh, you will always have a federated model that you can fall back on. So real good progress in Nova. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go over the components. This is, this is an intermediate level presentation, so I'm not going to go into great depth, but, but we'll go over them and we'll talk about their roles and how they scale. So uh, the API uh, service in Nova is a pretty typical OpenStack service. You'll see an API for almost all OpenStack services, and they all kind of look like this. Uh, they're launched via like Apache or Nginx, mod, w, uh, mod whiskey, or you can use the whiskey launcher. Uh, you know, directly, but you just kind of spin up more workers of that, um, more workers on more nodes, scale that out, put a load balancer in front of it, and it's a fairly horizontally scalable service. It's pretty easy. Uh, scheduler, again, we've talked about the scheduler. It has this, uh, this worldview, right? It wants to do an optimal placement. So it needs to walk through the entire database and you know, if, you, if, you keep, if you kind of think of compute nodes and their capabilities as a graph, it's, it's kind of a complex thing that it does. Um, but that aside, uh, I, I think the real problem that we see with the scheduler right now is just that uh, this data set is held in the MySQL database. And so we get lock contention. Uh, we sometimes get spurious performance just because everything else in OpenStack uses MySQL. So um, it is 
a horizontally scalable service, in practice, it's really a scale-up thing uh, for those of us running uh, OpenStack in production today. We can throw a strong CPU at it. We can, you know, make sure that our DB is really big. Maybe we can use some of the read slave uh, functionality or, uh, you know, some of the Galera, some sort of Galera sharding in some middleware um, to make sure that you hit an idle DB. But, yeah, we, we have some problems in implementation that we're working on fixing. Um, conductor, if you're familiar with the conductor service, this is kind of introducing Grizzly. Um, conductor is an orchestrator. It does do some transactional operations. Uh, but, the, but the heavy lifting of conductor is really proxying a bunch of DB calls uh, from Nova compute nodes. Um, so anything that your compute nodes ask for is going through conductor. Oh, uh, and by the way, conductor rides over the message bus, just like everything else. So this is a, a major thing that we see problems with. This is a you know, there's a sizable amount of traffic that goes on here. Even in a baseline cloud that's doing nothing, you have periodic tasks running, you have resources reporting in, and so this thing is always handling a lot of traffic. Um, so we do see issues with this. It's more related to our rabbit issues than the service itself. The service is horizontally scalable. You know, you can blast it out to lots of nodes, lots of threads. Um, it's a good design there. So moving on to Neutron. Uh, Neutron is kind of the exception in the core services of uh, its API service doesn't just handle RESTful operations. It also handles some intra-component uh, communication via the message bus. But Neutron server is horizontally scalable. You can run a bunch of them. That's been that way since oh, Havana or so, maybe, maybe a little post Havana. Um, and then of course we have common uh, agents here. We're going to have the L3 agent that handles routing. If you're running DVR, of course, you're in a fully distributed mode. Um, but there's also a federated mode where you can have L3 agents running on multiple parts of your network, multiple network nodes, um, and then tenant routers and all those things that get scheduled by the L3 agents, you know, they'll end up on different nodes that kind of distribute the load. So the one kind of gotcha here is that the, the placement capability is not that great. Um, it's, it's advancing, but it's, it's, it's fairly rudimentary at this point. Uh, L2 agent, this is what's responsible for doing all the wiring, um, the virtual wiring, so to speak. Um, and it's a, it's a scale-up model. Uh, I don't know. I, maybe it would be a problem if we were networking thousands of containers on a single compute node, but right now it's not really a big deal. So, DHCP agent, again, you can run in a fully distributed fashion. Cinder, so we have a volume service, which again has a scale-out model. Um, the caveat is, what is your storage backend? Uh, do you have a storage backend? Is it Ceph? Is it uh, some sort of NAS? Is it LVM? <clears throat> These are all going to have different behaviors. The Cinder service itself, though, I mean, you can run multiple services. It's kind of a multi-worker model. <coughs> For example, I have a buddy who runs uh, Ceph at a fairly large scale. Um, at a company next door to mine. And uh, he was having some problems with Ceph. He, he, he kept noticing that the Cinder volume worker was blocking. And he came to me and asked me, you know, well, what do I do? Let's, let's, let's debug this. Well, we went into it. Uh, yeah, it was kind of one of those eventlet problems where a C library was doing a blocking call. Eventlet didn't know about it, so the whole thread was stuck. Um, but the solution was just run more Cinder volume services. So we ran like 12, and everything was fine. Scheduler, similar problem, not as big a problem, domain. Uh, so we tend to not see problems with that in production. Backup, uh, again, just make sure this, this can be a service that handles a little bit more throughput. So if you're using it in your deployment, uh, just make sure you have lots of RAM and that it's spread out the way it should be. API, horizontally scalable. Okay, Swift. Swift is a kind of a Dynamo, well, I, I shouldn't say Dynamo-inspired, but Dynamo-like object storage system. Um, has a nice DHT model. Um, has a nice scale-out model. So to handle front-end traffic, you have a proxy service, and this proxy service can be distributed over a wide range of servers and load-balanced. And then you have container, account, and object services. And uh, container and account, of course, are responsible for the mapping, object, the actual storage, and this is a it's, a, it's a pretty simple 
model, right? The, the catch here is when you're adding more uh, nodes, more storage nodes to your cluster, or you're replacing nodes, or hard drives, or whenever you mess with your cluster, you're essentially removing buckets and adding buckets to the distributed hash table. So uh, the placement algorithm tries not to do this, but you will experiencing, experience rebalancing when that happens. Glance, this was our uh, image service. So uh, the API, again, is one of those services you can run across multiple nodes. It has a little caveat. There's, there's lots of throughput, you know, images can be gigs and gigs, you know, depending on <coughs> what your workload is, where you work. So what's important is on these boxes, you need to have large amounts of memory. You don't want those images, you know, you, you, you'd like to grab it, you'd, and then you'd like to keep it in the Linux kernel cache. Right, so if you have 256 gigs of memory and you have your 12 most common images in, uh, in Linux kernel cache, you can serve those straight to the network card. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the only thing I would say about that. Um, registry, really lightweight service. You just run a bunch of those. So now we get to my favorites. These are the special mentions. Uh, so when I deployed my, my first OpenStack cloud, um, ran into some MySQL problems. Um, looking back on the experience, I believe, again, it's, it, they're mostly implementation issues. We have some concurrency issues. We don't have the, the best queries going to those databases. <coughs> but um, when we talk about MySQL as a system, you know, Randy already mentioned that a relational database, it's, it's difficult to scale. It has a point of diminishing returns. When you're sending writes to all members of a cluster, eventually that write burden is just so large that it doesn't make sense, right? So we do see sort of an end to that scalability model, right? Um, but I mean, for the OpenStack um, deployments of today, it's just fine. It's just fine. You use Galera, you use uh, MySQL with standard asynchronous slaves, and um, just load, if you're using Galera, use it in the active, active, active setup, load balance those queries, you're gonna be fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, OpenStack's mission statement is that we wanna be massively scalable. And massively scalable to me, well, so AT&T says they're gonna go to three, 100,000 nodes. That's, that to me is massively scalable. So this may be something that changes in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now RabbitMQ. This is my ultimate favorite. Randy's gonna be, he, he's sick of hearing this, but. Um, so RabbitMQ was, was a quaint choice um, when we were first developing OpenStack and we were playing around with it and we wanted to make something cool. Um, I, I really, it, it really is at the root of a, a huge percentage of problems in OpenStack deployments today in production. Um, what, we's, what we've observed is that when you do the fully HAQs, active active, like a, a three member cluster where you're replicating all messages across all members of the cluster, it's just not workable when you get above, above about 200 compute nodes on a, you know, on a busy cloud. And, uh, so let's say you don't do that. Don't replicate messages. And just kind of have an active passive setup. <coughs> um, then you can get up to about 500, 700 nodes. But again, you're gonna run into the same wall. And I'm not blaming Rabbit. Um, you know, there, there are multiple reasons why this happens. Uh, my thing is, we shouldn't have a broker in the middle of a massively distributed system. Uh, there's no need for a broker. You know, direct communication, federated communication is the way to go. And that's changing. Oslo has a fairly mature zero MQ driver that came out in Metaka. Um, it's development mature. You know, it hasn't been used in production, but it has promise. So, All right. So, conclusions from this talk. Uh, here are the tactical things. All right. Uh, understand that you have limits on performance. Understand that you have limits on scalability. You need to match these carefully with your application's needs. And you need to figure out where is the give and take, right? What are your SLAs? What are, what are the real SLAs, okay? Uh, 
um, invaluable is to have a performance pipeline. <clears throat> Since we have CI in the gate, and typically when we do development on OpenStack, we have CI in our local OpenStack, uh, we don't see like syntax errors or a lot of the, you know, uh, easier things happening. What we see are performance regressions and, and feature regressions. So that pipeline is really important. Um, and then if you want to have an easy time deploying OpenStack right now at scale, your option is kind of to use small clouds at this point. That's the easy way to do it. Uh, Nova Cells could do. I'm, that, that would be, you need, you need a team for that. Like I said, um, you need to learn to identify your bottlenecks, learn to troubleshoot, open stack, learn what the, what the troublesome components are. Uh, my sequel, rabbit. <laughs> but yeah, so we see improvements coming. Nova Cells V2, that's coming. Really exciting. And the messaging improvements that I already mentioned. And just to wrap up, I guess, with some, some longer term thoughts or more strategic direction on scalability in OpenStack. You know, like Mike said, the mission statement of OpenStack is to be a massively scalable cloud. And I think what we're seeing is that you can reliably run a couple hundred nodes in a production environment. I mean, a lot of times people ask me, well, what does, you know, Mirantis has a distribution, of course, what does our scale lab certify? And so our scale lab tests up to 200 compute nodes at a density of 60 VMs, so 12,000 VMs. But that's a very specific configuration, and it's not exactly a realistic runtime environment. We, the Mirantis reference architecture makes a lot of assumptions. It has a lot of opinions about how to deploy things. It doesn't use SDN, for instance. Uh, so your mileage may vary depending on your configuration. And the, going back to the comment about the CI-CD pipeline, the performance testing tools in the OpenStack community, Rally and Shaker, they're very good, very good test suite, but they don't always run a representative set of performance workloads. So for example, if you're uh, a service provider and your uh, workloads tend to be VNFs, very different performance profile than what most people would test in the lab with tools like Rally and Shaker. VNF workloads are going to be extremely network intensive. So you may be talking about using things like DPDK or S or IOV they will likely be you know, less intensive on other parts of the system compared to a general purpose IT workload. So it's, you know, I think it's useful to have uh, a distribution with a scale lab that says under these this type of environment, this is what you can scale out to. But it is so important to do your own testing with your kind of workloads. And uh, again, another comment Mike made, understand what your real performance requirements are. You know, is it important to be able to sustain 100 tenants booting VMs at the same time? You know, is it okay if that is slow? Or do you really need that to respond in X number of minutes or X number of seconds? So it, it's very important to invest in your own, if you're going to try to push beyond that comfort zone of 50 to a couple hundred compute nodes, it's very important to do some investment in this area on your own. Because, you know, going back to the more of the strategic points here, we know that beyond that comfort zone, there are some known bottlenecks, they are being addressed, uh, but there are some fundamental questions about how to get really to the next level of massively scalable OpenStack clouds. There are some of those out there, CERN, uh, Bluehost, a few others, but they're all very heavily custom engineered. And what we're seeing now is the trend is not towards investing a huge amount in one heavily custom engineered cloud, it's people looking to roll out a large number of clouds in different geographies to serve their customer base. And if you're rolling out 50 clouds or 100 clouds, you can't custom engineer every one of them. So there's some real fundamental questions that you know, we're going to keep working with the community with, and I think everybody in the community needs to participate in these discussions on how to get to that next level of very predictable scalability. Um, so just a few comments, I guess, on what may be coming beyond the next release cycle. You know, Mike mentioned there's Nova, v, Nova Cells V2 coming in Newton, some messaging improvements. But beyond that, I think it's really interesting with all the buzz about containers, how might containers change this picture? So on the data plane, you know, container workloads obviously have a lot of advantages for the application developer or the, uh, the tenant uh, VNF developer. Um, because, uh, you know, containers are easy to scale out and have a lot of nice, other nice properties. But from an OpenStack performance perspective, again, containers, if you're using an alternate scheduler like Kubernetes or Mesos, they could potentially take some of the pressure off some of the known OpenStack bottlenecks like Nova Scheduler and RabbitMQ. 
if those components only know about VMs and there's a second scheduler that's handling the greater number of containers, that's an interesting model. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as more people start doing things like that in production. But it poses a whole brand new set of questions. You know, for instance, if you've invested a lot of effort in monitoring your data plane, collecting logs, collecting performance data from Solometer or using tools like Stacklight to get some metrics out of it, that whole picture changes when containers are in the mix. You know, some projects like Magnum have some interfaces with Solometer, but they collect a different set of metrics. Uh, and if, uh, you know, if you're orchestrating, say, Kubernetes through Murano, you don't even get that much. So it poses a lot of different operational questions to think about. Um, in terms of the underlay and the, the control plane, uh, there's a lot of interest in containerized control planes, and that will certainly help scalability in the sense that if you want to deploy five Keystone controllers instead of three, it's really easy to do that with containers, just spin up a couple of new uh, uh, containers. Uh, but fundamentally, there's parts of the control plane that aren't going to fit that microservices scaling model. MySQL, RabbitMQ, things like that, Neutron L3 agents. Um, and, you know, unless you're using an SDN that's uh, more of a microservices compatible model. And again, there it may be more of a direction towards federation. Nova cells to, you know, tier the, uh, the scheduler uh, and, the, and the message bus and the database, uh, some other models like that. So that's another, uh, that's another interesting area to look at. And this is, again, I think we need as a community to really put some effort into this area because people who adopt OpenStack are going to not want to necessarily have to deploy a lot of small clouds. In some cases, that makes sense, but then you need something on top of it. You know, you need something on top of it that can orchestrate things that should be in common if you have images that have to be shared, if you want to collect metrics across all your clouds. So that's a choice that some people make. Uh, there was a talk, uh, I think, yesterday about how to deploy a large number of small clouds, but then you have to invest in that management layer on top of it. So if you'd rather go the one big cloud model or you know, a handful of really big clouds, yeah, as a community, I think we need to start answering that question more. There's a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas here, but there's nothing that's you know, beyond the, con the concrete things like Nova Cells and uh, some of the messaging improvements. There's more questions than concrete answers right now. Uh, so with that, I think we've got time for a few questions. Uh, Mike will answer all the hard ones. And, uh, so if you have questions, please step up to the mic. <clears throat> um, are there any tuning that you recommend on the database? I've heard, um, like on the Nova side, you know, there are records that could be cleaned up. There are. Um, so queries tend to be very join heavy. Uh, you tend to, so, so, so like your sort buffer, um, you know, you want to have the right packet size to be able to track, transfer all that data. Um, those are the main ones that I would pay attention to. Also, in ODB, in ODB write concurrency, uh, IO threads, you know, these, these, are, these are things that tend to not be tuned by default. And they're pretty important. Yeah, and I think Mike mentioned this in his talk to you, but uh, with MySQL, sometimes if you're using, you know, regular monitoring tools, you may find that your database is still a bottleneck even if the database nodes aren't running hot. And in that case, it could be a lot of contention problem. So uh, one thing I think I've learned is have a good DBA who knows how to troubleshoot MySQL. That would be really helpful. I, sh I should mention something else. I gave a talk in Portland a, a few years ago. And um, another way to just get rid of this is to distribute your, uh, your reads and writes. And the, the, the only native way to do that in OpenStack today is in Nova. It's actually code that I wrote. So I'm going to promote it. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you can use a read slave and you can offload some of those reads uh, to a slave cluster and that'll limit your concurrency a bit. Yeah, and if you're a little bit more adventurous, uh, I think with some custom uh, health monitors in HA proxy, you can distribute read loads across all the members of an active passive Galera cluster and still have writes just go to a single master, so. More questions? We covered everything. It's very comprehensive. Okay, you've been a great audience. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you very much.